was a, a, a victim of Sharia law in this country where there was abuse and marriage fraud and the only way she could get a divorce was he served her with a piece of paper that said I divorce you three times went back to Pakistan leaving her very battered, very abused and £20,000 in less than money because he stole her money too but he didn't just steal her money, he stole her future because she's not divorced in the eyes of English law therefore unable to then meet somebody, marry and have a family she has been robbed of more things than we can ever imagine and it has to stop this is why I back Caroline with a parliamentary bill to address the issue of Sharia law it's really important that we understand that it's a very powerful weapon being used not just against Muslim women but against non-Muslim girls I believe there is a link there and we have to stand up and say it has to stop, enough is enough right now. Yeah. Yeah. now I'm going to ask Caroline to be the first speaker because I will tell you all now, Caroline has literally just flown back from Australia Woo! stepped off of a plane and come down here to be here with you people I think that in itself, please give her the biggest round of applause yeah. She is very much a hero of mine. So I'm going to hand this to Caroline first. There you go, Stan. Well, I just want to say a huge thank you to every one of you who's here today for this very, very important situation that we're confronting. And huge congratulations to the formidable Tony. Real boss. The bugleizer. <laughs> and we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Tony. Yes. Tone. Yeah. Tone. 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 I also want to congratulate all the women with courage to speak about your suffering. It's my privilege to know some who have endured such horrendous suffering, and I just got profound admiration for you, including, for example, one who can't be here today, but the very courageous Caitlin, who wrote that tragic account of her story, been a Sunday Times bestseller. If you haven't got it already, please get it and make sure other people read it. It's called Please Let Me Go and it'll give you a very heartbreaking, horrendous description of what so many people are going through in this country which would never ever be allowed. So please let me go. And she wrote it to try to help other girls to avoid becoming entrapped in the horrors of victimization, so psychological as well as social and physical. Others are here today, and I wish to put on record my profound admiration and appreciation. You are all heroines. You really are. And many of us are deeply concerned that too often those who have suffered, as so many of you have, haven't received the help and support from the professionals such as the social workers and the police. Time and again, public authorities have been inhibited by political correctness and refused to identify the ideological basis of some of the suffering inflicted on the victims represented here today. Now, I've raised this issue in the House of Lords. I've asked the government to make sure that they don't allow political correctness to inhibit police and others from protecting the law of the land and vulnerable people. And it's still going on. These are sensitive and complex issues there aren't simple answers, but surely our politicians and our public authorities mustn't downplay the ideological dimensions of abuse if it means that they can better support the victims who are suffering that abuse. We've got to stop being mealy mouthed and we have to tell the truth. Of course I'm aware that there are many other heartbreaking and profoundly disturbing cases of gang rape and paedophiliac, excuse me, my page is about to blow away, take that one if you will, so I'm on hand of your <laughs> Activities. But the nature of those activities that bring us here today is their scale and the ideological underpinning, as well as the impunity which has too often prevailed. 
I've had the privilege of sitting and weeping with those who are oppressed, abused, treated as second-class citizens. One Muslim lady told me, I feel betrayed by Britain. I came here to get away from this. The situation is worse here than in the country I came from. That's our country. And it's worse here than where some of these people have come from. It's outrageous. Another victim has repeatedly told me that the perpetrators... I haven't quite finished yet, so we don't... Oh, no, I <laughs> now she says I'm the boss. <laughs> she is. Tony's <laughs> always on the ball. I know she is. She's fantastic. Another victim has repeatedly told me that the perpetrators who inflicted such suffering on her are still driving taxis around the town where she lives. That impunity is something, again, which we must challenge. My lovely friends who are here today, women and girls are suffering in this country, but to make the suffragettes, we wear the suffragettes colours with pride, they'd be turning in their graves if they knew what's happening to women and girls in our country today. We must do all we can to speak truth for justice prevail and appropriate responses to the very disturbing situations which bring us here today. So I will continue to urge our government to take immediate action, including systematic investigation into problems of all women in similar circumstances as well as the implementation of legal provisions and policies to afford them the protection and the genuine access to the rights which they and you are entitled. The women who have told their stories have risked much. There are many who are suffering who at the moment cannot tell their stories. But I hope that those who have had the courage to tell their stories and have taken that risk will not have done so in vain. And we are here to make sure they will not. And it's a wonderful joy that a very, very intellectually renowned, internationally renowned lady that's going to be introduced by Tony in a minute has come all the way from Canada to be with us today. So I just want to say at this moment, thank you to everyone for being here and very especially thank you to those who have suffered so much and have the courage to tell how you suffered so that we may speak on your behalf to try and stop this suffering in our country today. Thank you all. I love you. Now you can all see why I hold this lady in the highest of esteem. And she's a lot more than a heroine. She's my friend. And I'm very fortunate she's your friend too. And that, I think, is no money can buy that. There is no money can buy that kind of passion and that kind of heart. Now the next lady that I'm going to ask, if it's all right with you, Rahil, can I ask my daughter first? This is my daughter. I'm very proud of my daughter because my daughter has the ability to see past the multicultural, let's say, molly coddling, for polite words, that we see in our country today. And she's got a poem that was written that somebody has asked her to speak out. Now, I believe this is a family member who has got a poem written by a daughter who was groomed and trafficked. She also has a few words written by a lady called Fozia Rashid. Fodi Rashid, another hero of mine, who has challenged Sharia law in this country and continues to challenge it every single day. That's what true feminism is. These ladies standing here today, this is real feminism. Not very fascism. We leave that to those who do not understand the importance of standing up. So I'm going to give you a moment to my daughter. Thank you. Hello. 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 Baby Bugle. <laughs> um, so I just want to read out the beginning of this before I read the poem uh, this was given to me from somebody to read out um, so this poem was written on behalf of a good friend from a genuine account of what happened to her I felt her story needed to be told and she loved it so much so she's given me permission to share it I've made a point of not mentioning specific details she's told me so she cannot be identified as she still fears being found Thank you so much, it means so much to me as she's like a sister to me and I hate to think what, how many more girls and women still suffer in silence. This poem's called English Rose. Just another forgotten English rose, our numbers too numerous to be divulged. Shut up for the sake of diversity, we're told. 
Our childhood stolen, abused, battered and sold. When it all began, I was only 11 years old. Ignored by the police, social services, MPs and councillors too, I ask you, what's a poor working class girl supposed to do? Just another forgotten English rose, our numbers too numerous to be divulged. Shut up for the sake of diversity, we're told. We're a generation, lied to, told diversity is our strength. Just another night I'll be raped by 50 strange men. Don't ask for help from the authorities, we'll only name you racist, prostitute and whore. While the line gets bigger outside the room where I'm lying naked, unable to move from the dirty mattress on the floor. Just another forgotten English rose, our numbers too numerous to be divulged. Shut up for the sake of diversity, we're told. Snatched away our innocence, too young to understand. I myself, like so many others, were just coll collateral damage in the globalist grand plan. Just another forgotten English rose, our numbers too numerous to be divulged. Shut up for the sake of diversity, we're told. So hold my hand and make a stand. I want the world to understand. It's not about hate and it's never too late. I look in my daughter's eyes and I see her innocence inside. That's what pushes me farther than I know I could go. This eternal torment she will never know. Just another forgotten English rose, our numbers too numerous to be divulged. No, I won't shut up for the sake of diversity. No, I won't be told. So this is a little bit from uh, Fosia. If we want balance and equality, then we must ban Sharia law. There is no place for it in a civilised society. We must not be cowed by those that scream Islamophobia, which is a word invented by people to prevent us discussing Islam and the separate cultural aspects of it, which are Sharia. We need to stand up against those who wish to spread extremist ideas, which not only oppress women, but which will affect a society as a whole. With love from Fosia. Okay, now, bear with me one moment, she says. Do you want to take those bits of paper for me, darling? Not that one. Um, I'm going to ask Rahil to come up next, because, I'm, I'll be honest with you, the two most important ladies here, other than, obviously, Baroness Cox and Rahil, are two ladies standing over there, and they're the ladies I do this for, and I want to save that to the last. So if it's okay with you, Rahil, everybody, please put your hands together. <laughs> the biggest cheer you've ever heard in your life. <laughs> Good afternoon, friends. I bring you greetings and hugs from your sisters in solidarity across the Atlantic from Canada. They stand with you. Even though they're not here, I speak for them. They stand with you. You know, usually when I go and speak somewhere, and I do a lot. I'm very excited and I'm inspired. Today, I stand here ashamed of my co-religionists and those men from my native land of Pakistan who have shamed not only our faith, but have perpetuated heinous crimes against innocence. These animals, yes, animals, have raped and plundered with impunity. I stand here as a grandmother, as a mother, a sister, and a daughter, and there is no way that I would ever allow or expect my daughters and sisters to, uh, to suffer in silence the way that they have done. So today, we will break that silence. Please say this. Today we will break that silence. Break that silence. And we are. We are here to speak about the atrocities inflicted on our sisters and daughters. Our beautiful children who are here today and those who are not. I'm here to speak about the grooming gangs. And ask the question about why they were allowed. Yes allowed to carry out their horrendous acts of violence for so long while we stood silent. We have among, amongst us here today 
women who have suffered at the hands of these rape gangs. We have women who have been subjected to shame and horror at the hands of Sharia courts. And we have women who are victims of honor-based violence. But I won't call them victims. I'll call them survivors. My friends, we live in the 21st century, not in the dark ages anymore. And we have a voice. We are fortunate that we live in countries where we have freedom of speech, yet our law enforcement and social services look the other way while young girls were being raped and kept as sex slaves. Shame, yes, shame on all of us. Very few people stood up to ask the question, why? political correctness, white liberal guilt, and the regressive left have had a huge part to play in promoting the silence. And what do they say? They say it's someone else's culture. We can't speak out. But I say to you that culture is no excuse for abuse. Culture is never an excuse for abuse. You will see and hear today from victims, and if that doesn't break your heart and spur you to action, then think of the women you love and cherish. Make note that the rise of radicalization in our communities, the misogynist and patriarchal teachings spouted from some pulpits, and the unchecked rise of extremism has caused men from some societies to carry out loathsome crimes with not enough accountability or questioning from within our communities and outside our communities. So in some way, we all share the blame. We share the blame for not speaking out. We also know that this is not something new, but we allowed this to fester until it became a virus and infected hundreds of perpetrators. And these thugs were strengthened when they saw the fear of being called racist or bigots which stopped decent people from speaking out. The fear of being called an Islamophobe. My friend, I am a practicing observant Muslim. Let me tell you that speaking for truth and justice will never make you an Islamophobe. Speaking out against human rights violations will never make you an Islamophobe. So don't let them shut you down. have been caught and tried, but others are free to put fear constantly in the hearts of their victims. What do we do? We have to round them up and jail them for life in a deep, dark dungeon yeah. with no parole. Because not only have they raped young girls, they have destroyed generations of young children. Or we should deport them to countries that practice Sharia law and see how long they last there. for a one-way ticket. My friends, certain state-run policies have failed us miserably in order to create a social, ju a social justice system. Multiculturalism has failed us. Political correctness has failed. Sharia law or any law that contradicts human rights has miserably failed. Law enforcement and politicians who look the other way have failed us. Islamism will fail. Yes. What has succeeded and what will succeed in Western democracies is the ability for people like you with a conscience to do the right thing, to break the silence and take back the values for which your fathers and grandfathers fought for this land. I want to thank my friend Tony Bugle. I want to thank Baroness Car Carolyn Cox, a lone voice in the sea of political correctness. I want to thank all of you who speak out. And I am with you. I stand with my daughters, my sisters, and all of you. And if there's anything I can do to help, I am here for you. Thank you. Thank you so much.
introduce you to Torrin. Now, Torrin is the mother of Becky Watson. I would ask you all please to keep as quiet as you can and try to understand that this could be your daughter, your granddaughter, your sister, your niece, your mother. It could be any one of us stood here right now. And that's why it's so important. Now, I know that Torrin has really struggled to write this, so please have some patience. And if you do find it difficult, Tom, then I'll finish it with you. Please, come up here, stop any feedback. Right, the media has never reported on who Becky was. Becky was my little child born, 13th of December, 88. Weighing at a tiny five pound four ounces. She was so angelic looking. She grew to be a fun loving girl. Always woke up with a smile, happily singing and dancing around the house. She lived for every new day. She was very loving and caring, inquisitive, mischievous and sometimes quite a feisty girl. She loved nothing more than watching episodes of Friends or films with a duvet, chocolate and lots of cuddles. Her laugh was infectious and her whole body would shake and fix a laughter, which was quite often. Her smile was broad and displayed dimples in her cheek. Her sparkling brown eyes with a thick long lashes would beam at you and it, sometimes it was hard to say no to her. She would light up any room that she entered. I could see so much of myself in her when I was younger. Her favourite time, obviously, was her birthday and Christmas, and she would insist that Christmas decorations went up, as this indicated, the 12 days before Christmas, and she absolutely hated it when they had to come down. She was a popular girl at school and surrounded by many friends who told me that they always enjoyed her company as she always was so much fun to be around. She never invited one friend around for tea, Always many, and I would often say to her, for God's sake, Becky, I can't afford to feed the whole street, but sometimes I manage. She was always eager to go to school, loved learning new things, and she was a, an animal lover, and always claimed that she wanted to work in South Africa with orphan chimpanzees. She was so excited and was in all phase about going to the secondary school. And I knew she wouldn't be bullied as she had older cousins there and she knew most of the children from the estate. But it was a matter of weeks that Becky became more challenging than usual. At first she thought she could I was try, at first I thought she was trying to press my buttons. But in such short time she started shooting and coming home late and numerous times she went missing. I could not believe how my child could change so much in such a short space of time. She was befriended by a 17 year old girl who um, was obviously involved in Pakistani men. I spent many painstaking hours searching for her and trying to find out who she was hanging around with. Many sleepless nights I would worry about her. I had a constant pain in my gut. Things just did not add up. I talked to her, I screamed, I cried many tears and I couldn't get her to open up. I felt I was losing my parental control and I recognised that I needed help. So I found family services but to be told by the social services that my daughter was not a priority as she was fed and not beaten and this was just another slap in my face. It took them till February 2002 to actually visit us. One incident on February the 21st, she went missing overnight. Returning the next day, this time I noticed that she seemed more subdued. Her friend that went missing with her was missing for four nights. (laughs) 
Sorry, I've lost the flight. The social services actually visit us three times that week and um, set some rules for Becky to follow. And she actually went to school all week and she never even asked to go out until February, oh, March the 4th. You're doing great! <laughs> <laughs> on the evening on 4th of March, Becky pleaded to go out just for one hour to, to an under-16 drop-in centre that was literally just five minutes away, and she desperately wanted to see her old school friends. As she kept her side of the bargain all week, I allowed her on the promise that it was only for an hour and I would be meeting her there at that time to walk her back home. 15 minutes after she left, I had a knock on the door from that 17-year-old friend crying, saying Becky had been in a car accident. My first thought was that she had been run over and maybe for just a broken leg, but that was not the case. A 20-year-old Pakistani man and a passenger had pulled outside the youth club and he switched his engine off. Becky was first leaning against the bonnet and it looked at first she was in conversation with him. She then sat on the bonnet and there was some sort of altercation and she refused to get off his bonnet. He took it upon himself to start his engine and to drive over 200 metres with her clinging on the side of the window. And this was in front of all her friends. And at some point, she fell off and sustained a head trauma. No other injuries or marks. I arrived at the scene with her 12-year-old brother to watch helplessly as the emergency services tried to resuscitate her lifeless body. Three and a half grueling hours later, I was told that she was brain dead and her life support had to be switched off and the worst thing I had to go through was tell her 12 year old brother that she's going to have to say goodbye. I read in the statements that the passenger kept telling the driver to slow down and pack it in. He did this in cold blood anger. It was no prank, only his prank and still fur. Because how dare a 13 year old white girl not do as she was told and show him up in front of his friends. He got three years and served 15 months. The police never asked for a phone and they were fully aware of what happened 10 days prior and all the other times. And yet, the chief superintendent visited me within days of Becky's death and stated he did not want her death to be classed as a racial attack. I told him he needs to open his eyes as there's something going on in this town and it involved Pakistani men and young girls and drugs. I never got to know Becky's full extent of her abuse. That chance was taken away. But the police confirmed in 2015, after a three year investigation following the Operation Chalice in Telford, that Becky was groomed at 11. And they have evidence on at least two occasions that she was trafficking to Birmingham and Manchester. I do not know who her perpetrators are and most likely never will, but they did say the, re the reinvestigation did highlight new perpetrators. Had Becky not been killed, I know in time she would have opened up because I was never going to give up on her. I live with the guilt and probably always will that I never protected her from these monsters, but she was trying to protect her family. I know if she had lived that she'd be standing here before you today as a survivor, but instead she is a warrior, like all the survivors, only she's a warrior with wings. Thank you. Well done. Well done. That is not reason enough for saying stop. Enough is enough. I do not know what it will take. I really don't. And I, I will be honest with you, I've advertised this event now for over six months. There should have been thousands.
thousands here. There should be thousands here for these women. Because their courage drives me and their courage should drive everybody in this country. And together, people like myself and Mar Hill and Caroline, we will never stop. Never will we stop. Sit back and allow it to happen. It has to stop. And political correctness is a cancer in this country that allows it to be. I'm sorry, but I can't hold my anger in. And anybody who knows me knows I tell it as I see it. And I am never ever going to dress it up to sound pretty. Because rape isn't pretty. It doesn't just destroy the girl. It destroys the family. It destroys friends. It destroys literally communities. And how many communities so far? 78. Bear that number in mind. Put that on top of female genital mutilation. Put that on top of Muslim women being abused by Sharia law. And tell me we don't have a problem. We do. And it has to stop. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I know that the next young lady is the most nervous here. And it, for her to be here today, just to be here, is a phenomenal feat. And I'm very, very proud to call these girls and these women and these survivors and these warriors my friends. So I'd like to introduce you all to Samantha. Please bear with Samantha. She is nervous and she's emotional because she is actually quite touched to see you all here today. Do you want someone else to Well done, Samantha. Hello, Samantha. my name is Samantha Shaw, I'm 23 years old and I'm a survivor of child sexual exploitation and grooming. I was raped, drugged, mentally and physically abused by a gang of Pakistani slash Bangladeshi males. I was passed around takeaways, shops, houses and put through some of the most unthinkable things. I was pregnant at the age of 12 and a half years old. I was supposed to be looked after by my local authorities. When I was young, I aspired to be a carer, but unfortunately due to the abuse I was subject to, I now have to have a carer myself due to mental health issues. I have tried countless times to try and commit suicide, and some days I can't see a way out. <laughs> but there are days when I do see a brighter future for myself, and my family, but mainly, not letting them win is what keeps me holding on. I can see me moving on and winning this battle and with your support I can get through this. I speak out in the hope that it will give courage to others even if it means prevent it happening just one more show with your support and giving people like me proof that there is people who care about us. I'd like to say a massive thank you to open. Thank you for giving me the chance to speak out. Thank you for listening. Well done. Well done. It's very rare that anything can bring me to the point of tears. But I don't cry tears because there's no hope. I cry tears because you give her hope. I cry tears because her pain is our pain. But we can't understand it until we listen. Listening is the only thing that will break the silence. We have to break the silence. So I want you all to, at the top of your voice, please shout as loud as you can. Break the silence. No more. No more. Break the silence. Break the silence. Break the silence. That's my girl. Now, lastly, I know she's hiding in there. The very beautiful Dr. Roma Tahir. Now Roma's going to tell you that something we all say and we're told we're racist for, and yet she feels exactly as I feel. 
and that's why it's so important that we listen to her. I've supported uh, Roma now for well, four years now, four now. When I first met Roma, you weren't the same person, you were the shell and you were very broken and together we've come on a long journey and we're going to continue that journey so I'd like to hand the mic to you and please tell them exactly what you tell me. First of all, I am part of Maurice and I'm so grateful for every single person who's actually come here today to show support and solidarity. Sorry. Um, four years ago, I met Tony. Um, as one think you probably noticed, I am doctor by title. Um, but unfortunately, life was not supportive of me. And there was a point throughout my relationship or marriage with a Pakistani man, I reached a phase being a very intelligent, articulate lady who was not able to cross the road. Can you imagine a 30-year-old, plus probably, who cannot cross the road? The amount of abuse that I received, it was not. But it was with the help of Tony and Maurice that I said no to this relationship and broke free. I came here to tell you a lot about, but after hearing those two accounts of their stories, and all of them because of Pakistani men. Do you know my heritage is from Pakistan, and I don't know what to say. I feel ashamed, ashamed that I actually carry those genes. You know, I cannot look in the eyes of those two women. And this is happening in this country. And where, where is it? Where is it? We need to be... Tell them what you told me about British culture. Oh yes. You're English. You're English. Coming back to what Tony's saying is, one thing I stand up for is my British identity. I am very proud of my British identity. And all I know, there's no Syria law in this country. There's only one law of the land, which is of our British Parliament. And we have, and what, what strikes me is Sharia councils operate really in this country to abuse already oppressed women and make them feel even worse about themselves. And I remember when I was getting abused, they didn't actually help, but actually added to my agony. Made me feel that I was the cause of all of this. And I think one thing we all need to work on, that these Sharia councils should not work. They should not be here, absolutely. And if they want to, if they want to operate, they can go to another country, Middle East. Absolutely. Absolutely. We need this ban. And please, when we say Sharia, I do mean Sharia in our normal ways. It includes dressing. We have to be, a lot of people think, oh, what Sharia council? No, it's just what happens in Sharia councils, meaning divorce, marriage. No, Sharia laws include your dressing. So according to Sharia law, you need to be dressed in a certain way. No, we need to be dressed how we like, how we identify ourselves as British. All I can say here is please support Marius. We need you, all of you here, to support not just people like me, but victims of these grooming gangs and Tony Honestly, it's working very hard with the help of Baroness Cox, with Rehu Raza, who's actually saying, yes, we are Muslims, I'm a Muslim, but we are here to contextualize Islam, into making sure that it is adjustable and is relatable to this century, not what happened 14, 14 centuries ago. Again, before I end, 
I really want to say thank you again. Also, my partner over there, Tamir, who's sitting over there, who always helps, makes me feel comfortable, makes me feel good about myself. You know? And this card is your own pink because pink is about feminism. It's about we, our womanhood. Thank you. I can see that we're on here. Thank you, Roma. And I will continue to support, but I'll never turn my back. Absolutely. Absolutely. I just had a little whisper in my ear, as you all saw. She does this, sneaks up on you, catches you unawares. I quite like it, really. Now, Rahil's husband is here, and he would like to say a few. He's the only uh, Pakistani Muslim man here today. And I think it's only right that we allow him to have his say, too. Yeah. Because we believe in true equality. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you, and uh, thank you for the introduction. I would rather not be known as Rahil's husband, but my, <laughs> my name is Sohail Raza. And yes, I am a Muslim Pakistani man, and before you start throwing things at me, <laughs> hear me out. Why is it that I did not turn out to be a rapist and a thug? The simple reason is that my parents, although they taught me religion, but they taught me humanity first. And my religious teacher was strictly told by my father, who was an, a rather overbearing uh, army officer, not to teach me, not to teach me anything about Sharia. Because Sharia is the evil that is plaguing our religion and the rest of humanity today. And the second reason I did not turn out to be a rapist is when I migrated to Canada, I engulfed myself in Canadian values. Because why would I leave Pakistan if I did not find something wrong with it? Something wrong with the value system. And the reason you migrate to Western countries is to find the freedom, the freedom to think, the freedom to speak, and the freedom to practice my faith and any faith that I choose. So these are the things that immigrant uh, communities, that immigrants are losing out on. They are not embracing those who come to Britain, British values and the freedoms, but they stick on with one leg in Pakistan and one leg in England. Uh, England. Sorry, I was going to say Canada. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that is not a very comfortable position. So we have to teach them, we have to encourage them to come out of their ghettos and embrace freedoms, embrace what is good in Britain, what is that attracted them in the first place to migrate. And the politicians have to teach them that, not you. The politicians have to stop being political correct and chasing the vote bank. That will be the undoing of Britain and Canada as democracies. Thank you very much. I stand in full support of Maria and shame on those that betray my faith and my community. Well, I think that's all of the speakers, apart from me. But my, oh, my daughter apparently wants to say a last word. Always wants the last word. How many tell she's my daughter? Just a second. I just want to say thank you to everybody to come, for coming today to support Mum and her organisation. I have to be honest, I'm the one at home that watches Mum in pain, in extreme fatigue, spending days on end in bed because she's so tired and so in so much pain because of what she does and she's just constant it's it never ends her support and her getting this the word out and breaking the silence it never ends and i'm the one that has to watch her every day in bed and pain and crying and upset you know and she supports me as well because you know she's not the only one that's gone through it and the other thing i want to say is people my age my generation I'm ashamed 
because they don't know what's going on. They don't want to know what's going on. And I get shamed for what I believe in and what I support. I get shamed for it. I get told that I'm a racist. I lose friends because of it. <laughs> and, but I, I am, and I think that people need to start listening and opening their minds. They think that the world's beautiful and that everything goes their way, but it doesn't. And there's people out there suffering, and they're so ignorant, they just don't want to listen. And I am ashamed of people my age, and I don't want to be a representative of people my age. I want to be a representative of No More Silence and Maria. I love you. I said, do you want to speak? And she went, oh, I don't know, Mum. She said, they might do. I said, don't worry, I'm used to it. Now, I actually wrote a speech, but do you know what? There's nothing I can say that will ever, ever say as much as what those ladies stood there today said. And I want everybody now, please, go on and find marias.org.uk. Go on and find me on Facebook. And the next time I do this, I don't want to see a hundred, I want to see a thousand, ten thousand, thirty thousand, because only then is silence truly broken. So please, we are no longer just women, we are damn warriors. Please put your hands together for everybody, give you the biggest round of applause ever, and thank you, all of you, who are all heroes. So thank you so much for everything and everybody who has turned up today. I love all of them. Yeah, get all the, get all the speakers on the stage. Get all the speakers and all the women. What we'll do is we want all the speakers to come up for a photo, but the other thing we want is we want all the women that are here and the chi children, child, we want them all to come. We all want a photo because these two ladies here are going to represent that it doesn't matter what you wear. You wear what you want to wear that makes you feel comfortable and just show the un unity between these two people. because us oldies can't get down on the floor, I'm afraid. And perhaps you're at the front, and I'd like you there. We should be arm in arm. And let me tell you now, this is the start of the new dawn of the real suffragettes, the real feminists, the real women. And that includes all you men out there, because you're the true feminists of this country too. Please applaud the men that are here, because I love them all. Thanks, everybody. Now we can all mingle. I'm sure Caroline will allow you to get a few pictures before she finally collapses and gets some sleep. Um, and everybody who's, who's sponsored a bear, who's, who's donated towards a bear, thank you all very much. Everybody who's here today, thank you. Could we please get all of the ladies to come and sit along the front here while we stand at the back so that we can get 
a photograph of the ladies with their rosettes on and like I said, the true representation of what feminism was always meant to be about. Freedom of speech, freedom of choice. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.